short and sweet. A line that will live in infamy for the Red Sox, Tom Werner. Full throttle, says Tom Werner. And just quickly as an aside, first of all, welcome into the baseball hour for the 2024 season. This is where the Red Sox season begins, at least as it uh, uh, pertains to those of us here at 98.5 The Sports Hub. We will take your calls on all things Red Sox, all things baseball. Through the course of this hour, if you want to hit on Shohei Otani, for example, by all means, we can do that. You want to talk about Jordan Montgomery signing with the Arizona Diamondbacks on a one-year deal for $25 million, we can do that. Uh, but whatever's on your mind, certainly all those things. Uh, tonight and every night on the Baseball Hour, for as long as the Red Sox are playing games, the first of which will be tomorrow night in Seattle against the Mariners in the season opener for both teams. That's a 10 p.m. start Eastern time. But the Baseball Hour starts tonight. 617-779-0985. Jared Carabas of Barst... Ooh. No. That, Sorry, that's two my jobs God! Ago. Two jobs wow, ago. that was like that was like that was like um, what you would call it? You know, uh, slip? no, no, just like um, muscle, muscle memory. memory. Yeah, that was like muscle memory. Mm. Wow. Sorry about that, Jared Krabbis of Underdog. Underdog. There we go. Okay, Jared Krabbis of Underdog. Mm-hmm. My Joining... dad's very excited that I'm at Underdog because you sang the Underdog theme last season, and he's a big fan of that show. So he's like, "I wonder if Tony's going to do it." And I was like, "I can prompt him to do it at some point." So you're going to have to bring that up. At some I won't do it tonight, but I will do yeah, it at save some it. point. Put it, put it in the holster. But uh, Jared Krabbis here to save the day, mm-hmm. so to speak. And he is presented by Blue Moon Belgium White. Be sure to relax and enjoy the ball game with Blue Moon Belgium White. That's Blue Moon, born in a ballpark, and brewed for baseball. So, uh, Jared, first of all, nice to have you back. It's good to see you. Glad we, were, Likewise, I'm glad we were able to make this happen again. And uh, let me just say quickly, because this is sort of a corny thing off mm-hmm. the top of the show. Mm-hmm. Jimmy, can we play a little bit of the show open again, just the music? Would you be <laughs> willing to do that? Can we do that? hang on i wasn't prepared for this i know i know you you don't want the show open you just want the music to it well you can play uh yeah really it's about the music more than anything else the baseball hour music yeah yeah i'm gonna ask you a question jared okay and see if um if you can put two and two together all right that's a tall task yeah so and and listen i'm not a huge music guy but i heard this on spotify in my car sure then i uh realized Whoopsies. Good, Jimmy. <laughs> Stu, that's good. Do you know the name of the song? I have no idea. Okay. The artist is a guy called Yellow Wolf. Okay. Whose real name is uh, Michael Wayne Atha, but known as Yellow Wolf. Y E L A Wolf, one word. Okay. The name of the song is Make Me a Believer. Oh, okay. okay. So th- is this a new song for this year? Well, uh, it is. We sort of went with that. We decided, you know what? We're going to pick a theme-specific show open sure. this year. We went with Make Me a Believer because I think that that is the challenge that faces the 2024 Red Sox. Mm-hmm. True or false? Uh, yeah. I don't think. No one believes in this team, Tony. Should they? No. Of course not. I, I told you today. I said I think I'm going to be even more negative this year than you are. Hard to do. Yeah, which is very hard to do. Uh, I, I'm now becoming... <laughs> you didn't have to agree so quick. Okay? <laughs> I think you. I'm now becoming that older, curmudgeon baseball person. Thank you. Where I think, because I, I do my podcast, Section 10, which is back. We have the name back with Tyler Milliken. Happy to hear that. And he's younger, so I think he's just blind to a lot of things, whereas now I have experienced more baseball firsthand. Uh, so... This team in particular, uh, especially last night, because we were recording as the Jordan Montgomery signing happened, and you could just feel the air get sucked out of the room. Like, we were probably 15, 20 minutes into recording, and, like, everyone is so excited because the podcast is back. We have the original crew back, and even though we none of us are really excited about the team, the energy was high. And then Jordan Montgomery to the D-backs, and the energy just gets sucked out. Everyone just – it's like a gut punch. And – So you you were still holding out hope that Jordan Montgomery could end up with the Red Sox. The point that I made 
was it's not so much disappointment that Jordan Montgomery as an individual isn't coming to Boston. It's the message that it sends. It's the fact that they couldn't go one for 25 or two for 50 because that's basically what it is. The option vests if he makes 10 starts this year for the second year. So it's more just it's the message that it sends that because the one thing that gets thrown in our faces all the time is Red Sox fans. Oh, you won four World Series titles. How can you complain? Yada, yada. We would love to have your problems. Well, since 2010, the Red Sox, will, if and when, and it's probably when, they finish in last place this year. That will be the seventh time since 2010 Correct. that they have finished in last place. They will stand alone. There are two teams at six. The other team, other than Boston, is Baltimore. And if you're finishing in last, that means that they're not. And they're probably going to win the division this year. So... If and when the Red Sox finish in last place this year, you will stand alone as the team that has finished in last place more times than any other team in the sport since 2010. So, yeah, all right, fine. Two, two World Series titles since 2010. That's nothing to shake a stick at. That's awesome. Those were very fun years. But seven last place finishes it's just unacceptable it's not fun as someone in your position tony you watch this team every single night it's part of your job to talk about this team every single night three straight years of of, of this and it's it's not so much like you know the and right, look right now it's three out of four and jared not to bust your balls over it but it, it, it's really since 2012 yeah right so it's even yeah. a couple of years after that Correct. 12 14 15 20 22-23. Okay? That, that is in a 12... Might as well throw 24 on there. Okay, but in a 12-year span, yeah. half of that time they finish last. Mm -hmm. Last. Keep going. Uh, it, it's even worse because when you point to teams like the Cubs and the Astros when they were in their full rebuild era, they were losing 100-plus games. The Red Sox, because of the division that they're in, they're going to finish in last place and be almost 500. So it's the worst place to be. Right. And You're which a means mediocre last place. They're still going to pick 15th or yeah, 14th. Exactly. Right. Like, and whereas the Orioles picked at the top two or three. The Astros were picking one and two. They took uh, Correa number one. They had Bregman number two. They could have taken Chris Bryant when they had uh, Mark Appel, who I love, by the way, as an individual. But like that's what the Astros were doing when they were finishing in last place every single year. The Red Sox had that one year in last place in 2020 where they ended up with Marcelo Meyer. Um, and it's not to, you know, discount what the, the, the prospects are that are on the way, but their last place run, their saga of last place finishes, it's not like it's they're going to turn out the Correas and Bregmans and, and Chris Bryants of the world. Like they, so it's just, it's super frustrating when, you know, it's almost, it's the, this ownership group at first, they came in so red hot. They're fixing Fenway. And some people at the time didn't want that. They wanted to tear it down, whatever. But they've made Fenway presentable again. And they they win you four World Series titles when you thought that not one was possible. So it's like you've shown us all this love. So we have this affinity for you. We have this emotional attachment to you. And then out of nowhere, it's just like, you know what? I really don't care about this anymore. I, I, I have a hockey team and I have a soccer team. And we want a basketball team once LeBron retires because he's part of the FSG as well. It, it's just it's such a weird dynamic because you can't say you don't love us Four World Series titles. Of course, we love you. Yeah, but it, we're about to be number one on the list of last place finishes in the sport. Very odd dynamic. And that's why going into this year, the dynamic of, hey, you know, one year, 25 million is all it would have taken to bring in Jordan Montgomery changes the entire outlook of this entire season. Does it make you a World Series contender? No, I don't think it does, but I go from, I'm sure we're going to get into season predictions about record. I'll tell you right now, 80 and 82 is where I'm at. 80 and 80, and that might be overzealous, 80 and 82. You bring in a Jordan Montgomery, now you're talking maybe 85 wins. You're in the hunt there. for a playoff you're spot. You're in the hunt for a playoff spot. To Felger's point last night when he said the last two years, a six seed has made it to the World Series. Both of them have lost, but they got there. It, we're in an era right now where it has never been easier to make it to the playoffs and the Red Sox just routinely finish in last place. Jared, I'll tell you what, if you wanted to take it a step further, okay, because, again, I'll tell you what, I'll hold the thought because a couple of people are on the line already 
about Jordan Montgomery. So let me bring in Kevin in the car. Kevin, go ahead. What do you got? Yeah, hey. Um, so my frustration is this. A lot of people were down on this team in the offseason. I actually think offensively they have a lot of guys that can overperform this year. I think Duran could. I think Casas could have a great season. I think Story could have a good comeback. Like, I think this could actually be a playoff team if they could have gotten that one piece. And it just blows my mind uh, that they can't go one year 25 for Montgomery. It's insulting, actually, is what it is. John in a car quickly on the same thing. Jordan Montgomery, go ahead. Tony, welcome back. You know, it, it's the epitome of why I, I can't root for this team the way it's currently being run. That is a no-brainer of all no-brainers is to bring that guy in for a one-year deal, and they don't do it. There's no method to what they're doing here other than cheaping out. And, Jared, I heard you talk about Fenway and how you – until they blow up that stadium and stop selling me a Fenway experience, I'm never going to get a baseball team. Okay, John, thanks for the call. So, so look, it's easy to say now because Giolito got hurt. Mm-hmm. But Jordan Montgomery at one year and 25 with an option or Lucas Giolito at one and 19 with an option for another year? You know, now we know that Giolito's two and 38. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer with the way Giolito's been going the last couple of years. Now, again, they caught a bad break there that he got hurt. I, I really do believe that that was bad luck. The guy has had no history of injury in the last six, seven years. Nope. Okay, none. So they caught a bad break. Even so, had they read the market, they would have known that Jordan Montgomery actually would not cost much more than Lucas Giolito did, and they'd have been better off with Jordan Montgomery. Plus, they don't have a lefty on top of them. Now, again, I guess Jordan Montgomery has a little bit of injury history that Lucas Giolito does not, so maybe you got to factor that in. But, Jared, when we talk about – you say they could have added Jordan Montgomery and been a playoff-caliber team, which I agree with. If we really wanted to push it, they could have signed Snell and Montgomery, had them both for $50 million, gone over the tax by a little, and then had a couple of front-end guys that might actually be able to match up with some of the better teams in the league, and Garrett Whitlock could be in the bullpen on top of it. Then you look at it and say, well, now where are we at the trade deadline and can we make a push here and potentially get in and who knows what? You got a couple of good lefties at the beginning of that front end of that rotation. So, look, it it would not have taken much in terms of long-term risk. In fact, it would have taken nothing in in terms of long-term risk. They weren't willing to do it. They weren't willing to do it, which is stunning given what they used to do and what they would extend to to win in the past. So you want to kick, here's my, here's my message to Red Sox fans. You want to kick the crap out of ownership, fire away. I, I'm not going to stand in your way. How could I? I feel the same way. I'm frustrated. Who's not? I'm pissed. Do you can't, we should never be in a spot where you're saying 78 wins is a good year. So you should be pissed. At the same time, at some point, I got to look at the team in uniform. And I got to assess the team in uniform and say, can they or can't they? So I said this to you uh, via text, but there is a path for them to be better than we think. Okay, so we'll lay that out. We'll take your calls and your complaints by all means, and we'll do it all year long. And if we have to kick the crap out of ownership all year long for the message to come across, then we'll do that. At the end of the day, I, you know, to me, the, the lines are open. You want, you want to take us down that road, we'll go down that road. And I'm happy to do it. I also would like to focus on the team on the field because I like the game. There's a story with Cora that we should delve into. There's lots of stuff to get into. We'll start doing it tonight with Jared Carabas next. Stay tuned for more of the Baseball Hour coming up on the Sports Hub.
Boston's best baseball banter. The Baseball Hour with Tony Maz on the Sports Hub. Do you believe this is a playoff team? Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of foolish to, to make predictions like that. I think this is going to be a, a very competitive team. I think it's going to be a, a team that is going to take, uh, that's going to see its players take a meaningful step forward. And I think, uh, you know, there's a really exciting young core of players um, that we are, are really, really excited about. And I think that fans are going to fall in love with. It's Craig Breslow. Start a camp. The Red Sox have their doubts. Most of them. I think there were people in the organization, some, that think that they could be better than people think. Maybe. I think the majority of people think we're not going to be very good. Uh, and, you know, that doesn't mean they're going to completely suck and be a 55 win team, but I think you're looking at 75 wins somewhere in that area. 75 to 80, whatever. I mean, you know, when we start, we start like dissecting the thing and, and micro analyzing it, whether it's 76 or 79, last what's the place freak, last place, right? What's the freaking difference? Yeah. Like, what's the difference? If it's not 90, you know, in this market, given what they've been during the large majority of the, of the Henry ownership, like, forget it. You know, it's, there's got to be an honest and earnest effort. To win, and, to, and more importantly, to build something. And honestly, I'm at the point, Jared, where I say, this is the part I'm most frustrated about. They've been doing this for four years. Okay, it's been four years since Dombrowski left. He left at the end of uh, 2019. Yes. So, four years. Are they any better off now than they were then? I don't really feel like they are. Maybe a little, okay? And that you say, well, there's a, a few guys coming up through the system. Meyer. Kyle Teal, Roman Anthony, Casas is already in the big leagues. Bayo is here. But they're, they're, but all of that's true, and they're still a 78-win team. Okay? And where's the pitching going to come from? That's the big one. The pitching in the system has not changed in four years, really. Bayo is it. And what's his ceiling? Like, I, I, I hate to be negative with Bayo. No, no, be negative. I, I, know you, I know you don't like Bayo. No, I do like Bayo. You do? Yeah, I like Bayo's stuff. What I don't like is the immaturity. But, you know, the inconsistency. But I like Bayo. I like Bayo's stuff. Yeah, I think I think his ceiling is a three or a two. Like, this idea that uh, he's a future ace, I, I don't see it yet because of the strikeout numbers. Um, I, I know, like, his, his overall numbers from last season kind of got skewed towards the very end. But up until, I believe it was the last couple of starts there, he was having a pretty damn good year for himself. So, like, I, I think that, you know, when we go, if we can just rewind a little bit to the Craig Breslow press conference, we were told that there were no financial restrictions. Correct. That was not true. I was going to say that's a lie, but I don't think it was a lie because I think that he was probably told that in the beginning and it just somewhere along the line became untrue. Same thing with Tom Warner. When he said full throttle, I think he was under the impression that that was the plan. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he was just throwing that out there for no reason. Okay. Um, so we were told no financial restrictions. That was not true. We were also told that, that they were in a position to make some deals that were potentially going to hurt. That didn't happen either. That's the only way that you're going to end up with some pitching in this organization. Correct. For whatever reason, they have not been able to draft, develop pitching for forever. Like in my lifetime, like you've had Clay Buckholtz, who is an every other year guy. Uh, and then John Lester is the lone example in my lifetime. Like I, I'm not even going to count Roger Clemens because I mean, by the end of his tenure, I was like, you know, I, I think. What year were you born? 89. Okay. No, you, uh, Clemens doesn't count for you. Right. I mean, he started, actually, uh, he started on opening, I was born on opening day, and uh, my nickname is The Rocket. Oh, that's cute. Boston Herald, front page on, my, on the day that I was born, says, like, The Rocket launches in Baltimore. So I was alive for Clemens in Boston, but I can't count him. So Lester's really the only example that we can go with here. So if you're going to bring pitching into this organization, it's going to have to be through a trade that quote-unquote hurts. Exactly right. And they didn't, and the bottom line is, uh, their system, and I'll say this quickly because I want to take a couple of calls. People have lined up, so I do want to get to callers tonight as well. But the, the bottom line, Jared, is this. Their system's overrated, okay? And their system's overrated because they don't have pitching. So if you're going to trade for a pitcher in another system, 
And as a uh, easy example, and now I'm drawing a blank. Uh, who went to San Diego in a trade? Uh, Andy Pitcher. Rizzo? No, 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 no. Not from the Red Sox. Anderson. Oh, um, Anderson Espinosa. No, 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 no. Who just? Who did the Padres just pick up as a pitcher? Uh, oh, Dylan, Dylan Cease. Cease. Dylan Cease. Yeah. Good God, I was drawing a blank. <laughs> Dylan Cease. Yeah. They sent back to the White Sox three pitching prospects. Yeah. One of whom was higher up. It was the guy they acquired from the Yankees, if I remember right. Well, you made that point last year is that when people trade big money pitchers, they want a pitching prospect in return, and we don't have one. Exactly. Yeah. So the Red Sox don't have that. Unless or, you were willing to trade Bayo, which they said no to the White Sox on, and they weren't able to get Dylan Cease. But there there are there are kind of like bizarro world Red Sox farm systems out there where it's like, hey, we are awesome at drafting and developing pitching but we can't draft and develop position players. Like there are organizations like that to where you may be able to make a trade for a flip flop. Yeah. It's like you, we're going to use our strength and your strength and combine on that. Okay. One. So again, are you going to give up Marcelo Meyer? Um, if you're the Red Sox? Well, right now it would be a sell low. Okay. So Roman Anthony. Absolutely. not. I almost swore. Okay. What about <laughs> Kyle Teal? No, cause he's right around the corner. Okay. Then you're not getting him. It depends. I mean, it, it depends. But, it really does. But do you want a front end pitcher? You got to bleed. Sure. You've got to bleed a little. They yeah. don't want they don't want to bleed. No. And they're not, and from that standpoint in some ways they're not in a position where they can bleed cuz they don't have enough of it. So, I like some of the positional prospects they have too. They don't want to pay for it and they don't want to give up talent for it. How the f are you going to get it? I don't know that they don't want to give up talent for it. I think that they were just maybe prospect hoarding a little bit. Um because you know, we Or they talk- tried to get it for Rafaela or the just the asking price was ridiculous because you know if if Dylan Cease was going to cost you Brian Bayo and then I I don't know what I guess some of the other trade proposals would have been for frontline starting pitching but a lot of the guys that we were talking about that we were targeting like we were targeting what some of the Seattle Mariners young arms like why would and, and, and they can contend for a division title this year so it's like some of these pitchers like jesus lazardo okay that's a guy but then the marlins might turn around and say like we have a chance to maybe make the postseason again like we're, we're not that far off either jared the right answer is they were delusional okay they were delusional they didn't have either have the artillery to get it or they didn't want to pay the price that it typically costs so and again yamamoto is a good example too he was a free agent the price went to 325 too rich for their blood mm-hmm. he wasn't going to come here anyway probably fine i'll agree with that but they weren't going to go to the number that it was going to take because they misread the market. The market, on, because all the big market teams were in on pitching, which means the prices were going to be high. Yeah. So that's the part that I look at and say they were delusional from the beginning. Lance and Nashua on the rotation. Get Lance. Hey, Tony, thanks for taking the call. I've said it before, best show on the station. Um, and I've been able to talk to you each of the last opening days of the show for the past four years, and it's a tradition like none other, other than the front office of the Red Sox over-promising and under-delivering. Like, at what point can we hold them accountable for no resemblance of a rotation at the back end we have four guys that are swing guys and this is the third year we've had to consider them at what point do we call hawk whitlock and crawford exactly what they are but on a more optimistic note jared i want a quick question um one thing i am kind of looking forward to seeing is the development of uh duran and tristan cassius where do you think potentially at their ceiling they could rank as far as their positions in the league? Thanks, Thank, guys. Thanks for the call, Lance. That's a good question. Just try to be tight, Jared, because yeah, up against it. Sure. Tristan Casas, I think we could be looking at a Matt Olson type figure in this league. Uh, the defense needs to make a big jump. With Duran, it comes down to health because we are talking about an individual that was leading or close to the top of leading the league in doubles last year. Uh, I think he can be an ele- – I mean, he's going to lead off. Like, he's going to have the opportunity to do what he did last year, and it was kind of a freak injury for him anyway. So, I, I actually, my bold take for this season, we were kind of just throwing out random bold takes. Uh, I said Duran was going to lead the league in doubles this year. Okay. So, look, I, I like both of those guys too. I mean, I like Casas better than I like Duran. Sure. Uh, you know, and I need to see some defense from guys who are positional players. Quickly, Rico and Springfield. Rico, go ahead. Hey, Maz, I just want to know if you were glad you helped run Heim Bloom out of town last year. Heim was ready to spend this offseason, and John Henry didn't want to, so he moved on. I'm sure the anti-Heim propaganda that you pushed every night at 6 Eastern last season made it very easy for him. Okay, I wasn't the only one, but if you want to give me credit, fine, I'll take it. 
And let me tell you, what, what was Hyam Bloom's number one responsibility when he came to the Red Sox, Jared? Rebuild the farm system. Rebuild the pitching in the farm system is what I would say if I was going to get more precise. Mm -hmm. Well, they were dead last overall. Yeah. So I, I don't know that it was specifically pitching. It was the entire farm system. Okay, so the positions got, the positional thing got better. Yeah. But when he comes from Tampa, what were you expecting? I was expecting all of it. I was expecting better pitching. Yeah. They still suck at it. Mm -hmm. Hyam Bloom is not necessarily gone because he didn't spend or they didn't win. Well, he wasn't allowed to. I, I don't know why the caller thinks that if Hyam Bloom were still here that the Red Sox offseason would have gone differently from a spending standpoint. That is John Henry's call. That's not Hyam's call. That's not Breslow's call. It is the, the general manager or the uh, chief baseball officer. They are the financial advisor. For the owner of the team, which is John Henry. If he doesn't want to spend, the deal's not getting done. Heim Bloom can't say, hey, you know what, John? We actually are signing Yamamoto. We're actually gonna we're gonna offer him three fifty because right now the current bid is three twenty five. You good with that? Doesn't matter. I'm doing it anyway. That's not how it works. No way. No, no, no. There's, yeah, I'm with you, I mean. There's no way he would have been able to do that. I would argue in terms of the development of the organization. The biggest thing that worked if they had been developing pitching and they were ready to introduce two or three starting pitchers into the rotation, I think everyone would have felt differently about High and Bloom. Yeah. I do. He didn't. And so he was brought in to rebuild. I don't think he did a great job of it. And if you want to say he didn't get enough time, that's fair. But do I feel guilty about, quote, unquote, running High and Bloom out of town? According to the fan surveys, I think the fans wanted him out of town. I think everybody wanted him out of town. So you want to pin that one on me? Fine. I've been blamed for other things, too. It's okay. Mm. But I don't think that's why he's gone. I think Hyam Bloom should look in the mirror and say, I didn't develop pitching well enough. The owner screwed him too. I mean, but at the end of the day, the the, the farm system, the Zach Thomas, uh, uh, Zach Scott rather, uh, uh, rated them 29th in the major leagues in pitching yep. as far as a minor league organization. The last time I checked, Jared, there were only 30 teams. Correct. Seems high. So that means that 29 blows. It's not good. Uh, that path to how the Red Sox can contend, which we never got to, we will get to momentarily. Sports Hub Headlines. The Bruins got back in the win column last night with a 4-3 victory over the Florida Panthers in Sunrise. Charlie McAvoy, David Pasternak, Trent Frederick, and Pavel Zaka each scored, and Jeremy Swayman made 18 saves in the win. Bruins' six-game road trip continues tonight in Tampa as they take on the Lightning. Andre Vasilevsky will be a net for the Lightning. The Bruins will go with Linus Olmark. A win or a loss in overtime.
listening to the Baseball Hour with Tony Maz on the Sports Hub. We have set uh, parameters uh, for him, and he's operating under those parameters. Can, can we surmise that there is additional room from where you are now compared to the parameters that you've set? You know, I, I do not want to talk about specifics related to payroll or parameters because it, it does nothing to help us competitively. And look, I, I think the focus on, on spending is fair and reasonable. Given where we finished uh, the last couple of years, we understand there's frustration. Uh, you know, when they're ready to, they're going to cut the payroll until they deem they're at a point where they're ready to take the next step. I, I think they should have done that a long time ago. You know, instead of getting people pissed off all the time, at least tell them what the plan is instead of, you know, leading them by the nose and uh, trying to sell them tickets. Uh, you know, people aren't buying the tickets anyway. Not like they were. So why are you BSing them? The people who are buying are people coming in from out of town. That's where the, some of the numbers are significant on the numbers. And I'm not going to tell you it's most because people are keeping their season tickets. Some other people are giving them up. I'm getting yelled at for that. Well, I don't, you know, look again, it's reached, I, I'm, I'm not, I would never, you know, I, I, I'm, we debate this all the time here. Like, I, I do you tell someone don't go? Well, no, you want to go, go. Like, you know, you do, you all have freedom of choice. And I understand there's value in going to the ballpark and everything else. And the Red Sox are sensitive about their business. So I understand all of that. At the end of the day, if the interest level goes down, that's on the team. Mm-hmm. You got to, you know, it's a it's a two-way relationship, Jared. The team owes the fans something. The team owes you something. So you may think you don't have leverage as a fan. You do. So that's my only message to the fan. They owe you just as much as they, you know, you think you owe them. So, you know, it's a two-way relationship. If they stop treating it like a two-way relationship, that's on them. That's a dysfunctional relationship is what it is. Now, that said, is there a path for them surprising us? Is there any path? Mm -hmm. I'll start with you because I believe there is, and I'm not telling you it's likely. I'm just telling you that there is. So is there a path? Yes, and it's basically what you just said. Like, yes, there is a path. Is it likely? No. Uh, I think the whole Andrew Bailey, Craig Breslow combination of – being able to tinker with guys, to be able to, quote-unquote, teach velocity. Uh, I think that when you have a young group, like with with pitchers, like can you teach an old dog new tricks? Sometimes, like Pavetta picking up the sweeper last year made a huge difference. But some of these guys like Cutter Crawford, I I think when when people talk about, oh, we want one of these young arms from the Seattle Mariners, and – uh, someone I forget who was saying it, but if Cutter Crawford was on the Mariners, he would be one of the young arms that you would be coveting to go out and make a trade for to add to the Red Sox. But since he's here, you're like, eh, well, whatever, it's Cutter Crawford. So do I think that the Andrew Bailey effect could make an impact on this roster? I do. Um, I, I, but what, what kind of makes me hesitant there is I've seen enough of the Garrett Whitlock in the rotation experiment. Same thing with Hauk. That's not to say that I don't like those guys as pitchers. I like them as relievers. If you had just gone out there, like just randomly, Michael Lorenzen, what did he get? $4 million from, from Texas. You couldn't have done that. When you talk about the, the Jordan Montgomery deal, because I understand that the priority was Yamamoto. Everyone wanted Yamamoto. You need this young stud ace frontline guy. We need an ace. Okay. Okay. But if you had gotten Montgomery and, you know, mid-level uh, rotation arm X, say it's Lorenzen, that pushes guys like Whitlock and Hauk down. That makes your bullpen stronger. I agree. That has guys that can throw innings in the rotation, which is what you need. I'm not worried about the lineup. I think the defense is is better. Uh, objectively, it's better. Um, but... It's not even like, man, why didn't you spend $325 million on Yamamoto? It's why didn't you spend 25 on Montgomery and four on, on Lorenzen or someone like that just to push those guys down that you're like to Nick, deepen the staff. Nick Pavetta is your number two starter. Okay. So he got so, demoted to the bullpen last all year. All right. But now you're talking about the off season, Jared. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm saying where they are right now. Yep. Okay. And again, I'm not telling you it's likely. The path for them to, to be in it, 
is what you just said. Bayo, Hulk, Whitlock. Story. Okay. Story's a big one. Okay. Because if that he's a middle of the order bat, he's an up the middle position. His defense, as we saw last year with Kike and, and the disaster that that was, defense at shortstop is very important. Having him as the number three hitter, that's important. He's got a hit. He hasn't hit since he's been here. He hasn't played since he's been here. Okay, so and we were talking about this during Felger Mez at the end of the show. I've always had this theory: the more ifs you have, the more losses you end up with. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and that you know, again, for the for the uh, stat geeks and the, the analytics geeks, I F equals L. Okay, <laughs> that's how that's how it works. Okay, I F equals L. I like that. But if you want to tell me, yeah, Mez, I think they're going to be good. Here's what I would accept as a, a, a way it could happen. Hulk's a first-round pick who's got great movement. If he stays healthy and gives you 30 starts, could you win 15 of his games? How many innings does 30 starts from Tanner Hulk look like, though? Okay, that that's 140 a, innings? Well, I was going to say it's 150, 160 innings now because nobody goes more than five or six. Right. Okay, so... But, but I would say something in that area because it's unlikely that you're going to push him to 190 or 200 mm-hmm. and you're going to get to that area and he's going to stay healthy. Sure. So let's think in small victories for the moment. How Whitlock and Bayo all stay relatively healthy, pitch 160 innings and have ERAs in the high threes or low fours. You're in, you're in the ball game there. Mm-hmm. You're in the game and you've still got Martin, Jansen, Winkowski, Somebody left-handed out of the, you know, the hodgepodge of uh, whatever that lefties typically are out there. It's not like you get some sort of left-handed horse. Well, your best lefty from last year is starting the year at AAA. Okay, so, right. So, I saw that, too, and and, and I, I'm with you on that. But I'm just saying it's got to start with the rotation. It's got to start there. Those three guys have to stay healthy, and I agree. Whitlock should be in the effing bullpen, okay? So should Hauk. But... Right now, it is what it is, and if somehow they're right about these guys and they finally hit on it, it can change their season. It could. Would I bet on it? Hell no. Hell no. I've seen enough. I don't need to see anymore. I've seen enough. So I don't think it's going to work. But you never know. You never know. We kind of know. Okay, so and again, and again, Jared, I'm just trying. I'm trying to lay out the the scenario. I get it. I get it. I, I I freaked out on Milliken over the Whitlock thing. I was like, listen, this is not the first year of it. It's not the second year of it's it. It's his fourth year in the organization. Fourth year, and he's an electric reliever. It's like, why do you keep trying to do this? That when he's telling you, like, my body won't allow for this to happen. Like, I, it's just crazy to me to keep rolling it out there. And when Hulk got in the organization, Milliken was in diapers. Yeah. Like, uh, Hulk's been here, like, seven years, for crying out loud. Oh, spare me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going uh, to take a couple calls because we're going to wrap up a little before 7 tonight. Bruins play tonight against the Tampa Bay Lightning. We have pregame in the game right here on 98.5. So we're going to take a couple of calls, and if we have time left, Jared and I will give you additional thoughts. But Steve is in uh, Carver on Raphael Devers. Steve, go ahead. <clears throat> Raphael Devers is the highest-paid Red Sox of all time. He has one of the ten highest contracts in MLB history, and yet I feel like we don't hold him to the fire, Tony, like we do with other guys. Like He showed up to camp this year 10 pounds fatter than he was at the end of last season, and, and we, we used to say that about Pablo Sandoval. Why don't we say that about him? He has all these errors. The last five years, no one in baseball has had more errors than Raphael Devers over there at third base. He's a horrible base runner. Look, I like Raphael Devers, but I don't think he's a leader in that clubhouse. And I just feel like because he smiles and jokes around and he's cool, like we don't, you know, we don't go after him like some of the other guys. Yeah, Steve, have- Steve, I'm going to let you go just because I want to get some other people in. But give me a quick thought on Devers. The, the defense needs to improve. Yep. And I said, I'll take league average. Just don't give me negative 18 defensive runs saved. If Correct. you can be league average, I will take it because the bat is there. And as far as the weight goes, he's always been a little fluffy. He's not fat. Sandoval was fat. He was a bowling ball at third base, and it, it, it hindered his uh, ability to play the position, whereas Devers, it's a, I think it's a focus thing more than anything else. Yeah, look, the criticism of Devers is fair defensively. Okay, He hit better at the end of the year. But the, the criticism defensively, totally fair. He's the least of their problems. Yeah. The least. Adam and Pawtucket. Adam, go ahead. 
How's it going, guys? Good to have the show back. Jared, good to have Section 10 back. Yes. Um, I just wanted to touch on the uh, the whole Alex Cora situation and how um, the organization is looking at this year as a whole. I feel like they're already throwing in the white towel for this year based on free agents they've signed um, that are injured or the people that are injured or the players that are injured already. Adam, just quickly um, on Cora. What does it mean for Cora? What are you watching for? Well, what what I was going to get to is, like, I feel like this is a wasted year for Cora, and I've heard a lot of things about Cora either not coaching after this year or just moving on from the Sox in general. And I feel like that's a that's a that's a manager that fits good here, um, and he needs to be in a big market team, and he's won a championship here. And I okay, just... I'm going to let you go because we know the background. But do you think Cora's gone, Jared? I do. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, I, I I'm not saying it's a hundred percent. Uh, but it's 80%, you know? Like it's I, high. I feel like he's just – he's tired of this. Yeah, it's you know? high. Yeah, it, it, I think he's had enough of this, and I, I think he's on a long list of individuals that are employed by the team that were told one thing and another thing happened as yeah. far as the direction of the team. Exactly right. I, and I'm not sure they want him anymore either. We'll see how that goes. But I don't think he wants to be here, and I don't blame him. And so he's remained here out of loyalty, which is fine, but I think it's over. Now, if they surprise us and they win 92 games and get in the playoffs. This is the Baseball Hour with Tony Maddox. Don't buy a boat this summer. Join.